Welcome to our live webcast, Erector Spine block, Plane Block, a novel regional anesthetic technique for acute pain. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jacob and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the Q&A polling window. There is a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the top where you will type in your questions. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Ask button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. During the presentation, you will see multiple choice polling questions throughout the event. When a poll is active, it will automatically appear in the Q&A polling window. To participate in the polls, please select the button to the left of the answer that best represents your views or experiences. We are joined today by our moderator, Krista Fortenberry, Professional Education Manager, Avanos, and our speaker, Dr. Brian Schmutzler, anesthesiologist at River Point Surgery Center in Elkhart, Indiana. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our moderator, Krista, for opening remarks. Thank you, Jacob. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are honored to have Dr. Smutzler speak for us today. Dr. Smutzler has a diverse background, training in anesthesiology, neuropharmacology, and acupuncture. He received his medical degree and PhD from the Indiana University School of Medicine and completed his internship at St. Vincent Hospital and Health System in Indianapolis, and also his uh, anesthesia residency at Indiana University School of Medicine, with a special emphasis on regional anesthesia and ambulatory anesthesia. Dr. Smutzler is a board certified in anesthesia and the chief anesthesiologist at River Point Surgery Center in Elkin, Indiana. He is also the owner operator of Clinical Colleagues of Indiana, PC, Anesthesia Consulting and Clinical Specialists, LLC, and New Amsterdam Anesthesia, PC. Currently, Dr. Schmetzler actively participates in, in anesthesia practices, excuse me, in anesthesiology and acupuncture in Indiana and Michigan. This evening, Dr. Schmetzler will review his clinical techniques as related to erector spinae plane blocks. Thank you all for your engagement and participation. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Brian Schmetzler. Thank you, Krista. Um, <clears throat> I tend to keep my presentations fairly informal. Uh, and so as uh, Jacob said, you'll have some questions or if you have questions, just pop them up on the, on the box on the side there and Jacob will interrupt me uh, as I go and I'm happy to answer questions as we go. Hopefully I'll impress upon you tonight um, how passionate I am about the erector spinae plane block, how ubiquitous the block is and how powerful it is in the armament of, of any anesthesia provider. Uh, to get started, I'd like to talk just a bit about There we go. Uh, uh, disclosures, obviously I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Avanos Medical, the, uh, the manufacturer of OnQ. Um, when I start giving talks, I like to talk a little bit about the opioid crisis. Uh, when I first began giving talks about 10 or 12 years ago, and I talk about the opioid crisis, most of the time people kind of laughed it off. It wasn't quite the issue that it was that it is now. Um, but currently, I think it's pretty obvious that most of us understand that we're in the midst of a, a pretty bad opioid epidemic here in the United States. That opioid epidemic is costly. Um, U.S. healthcare costs attributed to opioid abuse. Are, are quite large, 25 billion, with societal costs as high as 56 billion. Um, obviously, opioid abusers cost employers more money per year than, than non-opioid abusers. Uh, healthcare spending in the United States, now this is 2010 data, the most recent data is about 3.3 trillion, um, and much of that is spent on prescription drugs, uh, in fact, 10%, and a huge portion of that is spent on opioids. Um, I think probably <clears throat> most poignantly, from 1997 to 2011, uh, the consumption of hydrocodone doubled and the consumption of oxycodone increased nearly 500 times. Uh, not only that, but there was a 900% increase in individuals seeking treatment for addiction to opioids. The United States uses somewhere between 95 and 100% of the world's hydrocodone and oxycodone. 
And so I think it's pretty clear that we have a problem here in the United States. Even a one-day opioid prescription poses a 6% risk of long-term use and abuse. 20% of patients become routine opioid abusers after 10 days of opioid use. And there is some evidence that between one and 3% of people who even receive one dose of an opioid perioperatively can go on to long-term opioid use. Uh, I show this picture uh, for a couple of reasons. One, to impress you. Um, if you guys know who this is, this is Dr. Jerome Adams. He's the Surgeon General of the United States. He was actually my staff when I was a resident at the County Hospital in Indianapolis. Taught me how to do a number of blocks, uh, adductor canal blocks and popliteal blocks. Um, but I not only show this to you to impress you, but also uh, to, uh, to identify him um, and his project uh, before the whole coronavirus um, came about was a reduction of, of opioid use in the United States. He had a, a half brother who had an opioid addiction. So he said that four out of five people with substance use disorder say they started with a prescription opioid. And his edict is that healthcare professionals should promote evidence-based non-opioid treatments for pain. I do wanna throw in a couple of new slides uh, that, I, that I put in here recently. Um, given the coronavirus uh, pandemic that's occurred, uh, the Society of Regional Anesthesia, American Society of Regional Anesthesia, ASRA, um, has uh, also said that regional anesthesia is now preferred over general anesthesia for patients with COVID-19 to reduce the need for aerosolizing generating medical procedures, of which they count intubations and, and even LMA placement. So I think even more than ever, um, having in your hands something that you can do outside of general anesthesia, perhaps doing cases under regional anesthesia, and particularly with this block, is, is gonna be quite helpful. I think this is gonna likely uh, lead to a need for increased use of regional anesthesia for the foreseeable future. Uh, and again, this is another benefit of regional anesthesia, aside from better pain relief, decreased length of stay, and better patient satisfaction, less opioid use and abuse. Now, we can also use regional anesthesia to reduce the risk to healthcare providers and actually anybody who's in the room when a uh, uh, procedure is taking place. So Dr. Smetzler? Yes. Uh, based off of our poll so far, we have 60% of our attendees are, are doing blocks. Great. 35% are have a high five comfort level. Nice. And 78, or excuse me, 80% are using the catheters. Oh, great. Perfect. Good, good. Good to know. Um, this is just, again, another slide kind of uh, discussing from the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, discussing why regional anesthesia is preferred over uh, general anesthesia and kind of how to, how to do that. So um, now we'll kind of get into the crux of the talk, the erector spinae block itself. As I mentioned, this block is really... It's been powerful in our practice in a number of ways. We've replaced a number of blocks that we've done in the past with the erector spinae plane block. And then we've also added the erector spinae plane block to procedures that we didn't have any regional anesthesia to offer previously. So we'll begin by just talking a little bit about the anatomy. Uh, the goal of the erector spinae plane block is to block the ventral and dorsal rami and possibly the ganglion. You can see on this slide that basically when we do the erector spinae plane block, we'll come in, we'll touch that transverse process, back off, and we'll deposit local anesthetic underneath the anterior fascia of the erector spinae muscle and posterior to the transverse process. What that does, it covers that ventral rami of the spinal nerve, the dorsal rami of the spinal nerve, and then it even kind of creeps over and grabs some of that a dorsal root ganglia, as well as a sympathetic ganglia. There's also a couple of studies now that are showing that some of that local anesthetic actually spreads into the ipsilateral epidural space as well. When discussing the erector spinae plane block, I like to discuss a little bit of the sono anatomy. I compare an erector spinae plane block to another plane block that lots of us are pretty familiar with called the, the, uh, the tap block. Um, when you're doing a tap block, you're looking at those three layers of muscles and then going between the second and third layer between the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis muscle. When you're doing an erector spinae plane block, you're looking to actually go underneath the erector spinae muscle and above the transverse process, so all the way down to the bone. What's interesting about the erector spinae plane is that it, the muscles creating that particular sono anatomy change as you go from high thoracic to mid thoracic, to low thoracic and lumbar. 
So when you're up higher, the top layer is that trapezius muscle, often fairly large in most patients. The rhomboids underneath that and the erector spinae muscles are underneath that. If you go in between the transverse processes, underneath the erector spinae muscle or the intercostal muscles, that's too far. As you go further down, that rhomboid disappears and the lat comes in. Uh, what's interesting in this layer is that the trapezius and the lat have muscle striations that go different ways, so they're pretty easy to tell apart. And then under the lat, you've got the erector spinae and again, the intercostal muscles. As you come down to the low thoracic and high lumbar region, that trapezius disappears, you've got the lat dorsi, you've got the posterior inferior serratus, which is often a fairly small muscle, and then the erector spinae multifidus. Obviously, there, are, there aren't any ribs once you get into the lumbar spine. So uh, there is uh, no intercostal muscle underneath. Um, the erector spinae multifidus is called that multifidus down lower in the lumbar region because instead of being strictly parallel with the spine, it starts to fan out and attach to the iliac crests on the outside. And so um, I'll show you a little bit later in a video, we kind of have to change the orientation of our ultrasound probe just a little bit to keep that erector spinae plane in plane with the ultrasound and give yourself a little bit better picture when you're doing erector spinae plane catheters in the lumbar spine. Really the, the big question is, so how does the local spread, how does it work? Before we get there again, I just wanna point out to you exactly how we do the erector spinae plane block. It sounds like a lot of you do them, so I won't belabor the point too much. But basically the needle location is the tip of the transverse process. And I'll show you some videos as to how we do this. We, we get right off there off the tip of the transverse process. And then we deposit the drug between the transverse process and the anterior fascia of the erector spinae muscles. So as I said, the million dollar question, how does the local spread, how does it work? Well, it's pretty clear that the local anesthesia the local anesthetic spreads down the erector spinae plane itself. That helps us catch that dorsal rami of the ventral nerve, and so it gets essentially the, the muscles in the back and the skin uh, covering the back. But what's really important is that, that that local anesthetic kind of tracks itself into the paravertebral space. So essentially by doing an erector spinae plane block, you are getting a paravertebral block. Most of the studies are now agreeing that, that some of that local anesthetic traverses into the dorsal root ganglia. So that gives you an even denser uh, sensory block. And then a couple of cadaveric studies have shown spread into the ipsilateral epidural space. Whether that's actually occurring in humans and what the clinical relevance of that is, is still to be, to be determined. But uh, definitely I think we get some spread into that ipsilateral epidural space just because of how uh, sort of profound the block is. I'll show you a little bit of ultrasound anatomy now. Um, and I always tell people I didn't do you a whole lot of favors here because this is a pretty thin patient. You're talking about half uh, of a, an inch here um, down, down from, the, uh, from the skin. But we're down lower here in the thoracic, uh, low thoracic, high lumbar spine. Uh, you've got your lat dorsi, your serratus, and then your erector spinae muscles. Your erector spinae plane, you can almost imagine it right over the top of those transverse processes. There's a couple of transverse processes here and then one down a little bit lower. And so our goal again is to hit that transverse process with the needle, back off ever so slightly, just enough to come off the bone so you're able to inject and then make sure that you're getting the local anesthetic underneath the erector spinae plane, the, the anterior fascia of the erector spinae muscle and posterior to the transverse process. When we do these blocks, we tend to do them in the prone position. Uh, there are some, some, uh, <clears throat> some examples where we don't, but for the most part, we'll take the patient on the cart, we'll have them hug the cart, bring their arms over the cart, and then we'll place the, uh, the catheter that way. What that does, that gets all that subcutaneous tissue out of the way. We have larger patients where I am in Northern Indiana. Many of our patients are 120, 140, 160 kilos. So that gets all that subcutaneous tissue out of the way. It also kind of gives us a table to work from. I lay all my supplies on uh, the patient's lower back. And then the other thing is it allows us to sedate the patients a little bit more and then um, really it allows us to work a little bit easier. Um, I see a lot of people do these sitting. That's totally fine. For us, it was a little bit difficult. I needed another nurse uh, to hold the patient um, as we do with epidurals. And then I felt like I needed a third hand. It was kind of hard to hold everything at the same time. 
when you're prone, you've got the patient laying there, you're able to just kind of set that ultrasound down, bring that needle in, uh, and just a little bit easier that way. Uh, this is just a real quick video. This one was one we did in the, uh, in the lateral position. You can see that needle coming through, and I'm actually gonna try to pause it if I can find my, now there we go. So we're bringing that needle through, we're touching the transverse process, boom. You can see we start to inject and it looks like we're intramuscular. We're not under that anterior fascia. So we'll back up, we'll redirect, and we'll scoot underneath that fascia and then we'll inject and we see it open up real nicely. Looks like a fish mouth opening up and closing, opening it up, up and closing. Once you get in the right spot, you can definitely tell uh, that you are in the right spot. This is one that we did with the catheter through the needle. We almost exclusively use the catheter over needle now, but you'll watch on the, on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see that catheter come through and there it is coming in. Catheters thread really nicely through this, uh, through this plane. It's a nice big plane. Some clinical pearl pearls, anybody who does regional anesthesia, I always say shift the needle rather than the probe. So you wanna take that probe, you wanna get it in the right spot. Once you get in the right spot, you wanna put the needle into the into plane. You don't wanna be moving everything at the same time or you never get there. When we first started doing these blocks, we used uh, some normal saline on a stopcock at the end. We found that you know sometimes the first few times you do these blocks, you have a little bit of trouble getting right into the right spot and we were wasting some local anesthetic. We don't actually do that anymore because we've done a bunch now, but um, I would suggest when you kind of first start doing these, or if you have a patient who's larger, that you do have some, some uh, saline on the stopcock. Make sure that you're in the right spot with the saline, then switch over to the, to the local anesthetic. Um, we used to add epinephrine. Now, we don't do that so much anymore, uh, but we do add uh, dexamethasone and dexmedetomidine. Um, and then uh, uh, typically we'll use half percent ropivacaine for this. So I'll use anywhere from 15 to 30 milliliters of half percent ropivacaine per side. Add to that 10 milligrams of preservative-free dexamethasone and 50 to 75 mics of uh, dexmedetomidine um, across the whole block. Um, and so that gives us typically about 18 hours of, uh, of initial block. That gives us time to build up the local anesthetic with our catheter running with the on cue ball. Uh, and it, we really get very little drop in pain relief. Um, we found that if we didn't add the additives and we didn't do a catheter, we typically lose, uh, lose our, our great effect at about eight hours. Um, and then, you know, 18 hours is good, but it's not what we want. We leave these catheters in anywhere from three to seven days. Just another uh, ultrasound uh, picture here, needle coming through, touching the tip of that transverse process right underneath that erector spinae muscle. I've got a couple more videos here. Uh, we filmed this at one of our cadaver labs. Uh, these are a little bit longer videos, but I'll, I'll kind of talk through some of them. Um, the first video is scanning on a live patient. Uh, I like scanning on the live patient. I'll walk you through kind of what I do before I actually do it. But I put that ultrasound probe right on the spinous process because no matter how big the patient is, you're always going to be able to find spinous process. Slide laterally, you'll see lamina. After lamina, you'll see that transverse process pop up. That's where you want to be. I'll always scan past that transverse process and then you'll be out on the rib. That, that means you, you know you've gone too far lateral. You come back up and then you'll see that transverse process again. So we'll go ahead and start that video. Um, I'm not really able to use the scapula as a landmark, so I'll just go up into the neck, and I just call that C7, just out of convention. Again, you get so much spread with this block that if you're at T1 and not C7, you're one level different. It's not a huge deal. So I'll come up into the neck, and I'll kind of feel C7, which I think is about there. And then I'll just walk myself down. So let's call that T1, T2, T3, T4. And that's where I'll start, all right? Uh, gel's cold. Okay, sorry about that. So again, we do these in the prone position. It really, really helps us with positioning, with getting the, the probe in the right place, and then just ergonomically, it seems to work better for us. I typically go caudal to cranial. Um, I do that just out of convention. All of our rooms, uh, pre-op rooms and our operating rooms, are, are set up so that I walk in on the patient's left side, and so that just makes it easier. I'm right-handed, I go caudal to cranial. Sir. And again, I, I come caudal to cranial. I try to make it, there we go. 
I try to make it so that I'm coming right to left on the screen. It's just easier by convention for me. I'm, I'm not picky a little bit. Of Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not picky about how you hold the probe. Some people are, you know, do it, whatever works for you. So if you start to come in here, you'll see spinous process, spinous process. We'll slide a little bit lateral. And there's your lamina down at the bottom. Pile of sticks. Okay. There we go. Well, so they, they kind of lay on top of each other. Again, this is like the classic display. This is what the academicians. Yeah, sure. Right there. This is what the academicians say. I just, you know, I'm, I'm parroting their all their study or their all their descriptions in the in the literature. But they, they say that this it's a pile of sticks because the lamina kind of lay on top of each other. Slide a little bit more lateral, you'll start to see that TP come in right about there. Can we sharpen up the image a little bit? And so what you can see is you can see transverse process, transverse process. And you're just going to come, I'm probably going to aim for this one, right? The transverse process looks kind of, people describe it more like a Lego block, kind of a block shape. As you slide out to the rib, it's much more rounded. So uh, I think you'll, I'll show you that here in just a minute. Right here. And what I'll do is I'll just come, you know, I use the longer, um, the longer catheter over needle. So there are fours. The catheter itself is about three and a half. So I'll come and, and I'll try to figure out the angle that, uh, that I can use to get it as flat as possible, as shallow as possible. I'll bounce right off that transverse process, back off, and inject local anesthetic. So this is probably top muscle, you know, probably trap, probably round, rhomboid, and then she's got a pretty, um, pretty thick uh, rectus spinae muscle. And she, she was pretty thin, so it's nice. You can see each of those layers and then the nice shiny fascia in between each one. So this is, you can kind of almost imagine that plane right there. You can sort of see it blacking out there. So that's where you'll go. If you slide even more laterally, you end up on rib. And you can see pleura underneath. So go ahead and take a dip, big deep breath. And your pleura moves down here. You can put that up here. There we go. One more big deep breath. You see pleura moving down there. So that means you're too far lateral. Okay. And it's it's uh, it's subtle, you know. If you going going from TP to rib is not real far. Big deep breath. You can see it, the one moving around. There. I'll do both from the same side, so I'll just come back to spinous. So there we are on spinous again. Spinous process right there, big white line. If you do TP with a big breath, just see the difference. Yeah, TP with a big breath, sure. So I think you kind of get the sense of, uh, of what we do for our uh, kind of scanning. And I'll spend a significant amount of time scanning until I see exactly what I want. Um, and especially when I first started doing these, you know, I'd spend a good 10 minutes scanning just to make sure I knew exactly where I wanted to be. Um, I'm not really greater scalings also. Everything except superficial cerebral right. plexus. So, let's pop forward to the next one. Uh, this was actually done on a cadaver, so I'll show you actually how I, how I use the needle, see the needle hitting the transverse process, backing off, injecting the, uh, the fluid, and then you'll see how I thread the catheter in. The catheter over needle has been, been great for that, so we'll go ahead and just play some of this video here. Interscalings also. Everything except superficial cervical plexus catheters. All we have are catheter. Is Troy your rep or is well, well, he said that I'll show you said a little trick. Getting, he said also they're getting rid of the like, coating. Okay. I'll show you a little trick with them. So again, we're we're in the the thoracic region, probably high to mid thoracic, and we'll go ahead and just show the uh, the placement here. All right, perfect. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Okay, that's a lot better. Okay, 
so there's your spinous process. Now she's got some sort of kyphotic goofiness here, but um, so there's your spinous process there. Yeah, yep, right there's one, and then sorry, there's one right there. All right, so we're gonna slide lateral. I actually have one of these. <laughs> All right. So there's your lamina down there. Looks more like a pile of stakes here, maybe. And then you slide, and there's your TP. So you're going nice right there. Now I'm gonna put that on the far side of the screen from me. Got two in there, yeah. yeah. So what I do. Uh, so you can see both of those transverse processes nicely. We want to slide it to the opposite side of the screen. Again, you want your angle of incidence to be as shallow as possible. And then I'll put a nice big nick in the skin here. Those catheter over needles are big, big catheters. So we put that big nick in the skin and thread it right through. So I'll show you that. All right, so what I do here, I'll actually give a little poke. The 18. The 18, yeah, it comes in the kits. That's what I was showing you from the kits. And I'll, I'll really, I really, and so I, I localize this first. I give them a little bit of, a little bit of sedation for this. But if you localize it, they don't mind. And then I'll actually track this in, so you can actually see the oh, yeah. coming through, right? So I like that trajectory. And now live patients bleed, but this guy won't so much. And so you just got to find your hole on these. So if you come right through the hole, it goes in really smoothly. See, it comes right in. Too oh, we'll see. There is a little bit too shallow. So I'll just back up a little bit. See the needle so coming through really pretty nicely. Again, a, a pretty thin patient, but you see that needle come through nicely. You'll see us touch the transverse process. Again, we're shooting. So you try to make contact right at the plateau. Uh, ju yeah, ju just at the sloping up. So okay. So now I'm hitting bone. Okay. Probably want to smooth up that image a little bit. That's okay. All right. So go ahead and if someone can inject for me. Inject. 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 Okay. Going okay. Let's see it peeling that muscle off. Yeah. And that's what you want to see. You want to see that muscle peeling up. Looks like the bone is coming down. The muscle is peeling up. So. Pretty nice view right so there. Peel. Go ahead and inject a bunch. Okay. See it peel that muscle right off. So this looks like it's coming down. The muscle looks like it's sure. coming off. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Keep going. Okay. All right. Perfect. So muscles coming up, bones coming down. So then I'll drop the probe. Thread that catheter in, and I actually thread it right off. Seldinger technique it off until it's hooked. And we'll move this over. You'll be able to see nicely that that catheter stayed right in that uh, rectospinate plane. What's really nice about these catheters is they're pretty echogenic. So you can actually see the catheter coming in. So you see the catheter right here. <laughs> and so I'll just follow that catheter in. Follow it in, follow it in. All right, and then we'll inject a little bit more here. So there's the TP we were at before. And it's up here a little bit higher. See the catheter there? Yeah. And it's pushing it right up. Pushing that muscle right up. Greater scalenes also. Uh, so hopefully that gave you a, a nice representation of how we actually do these blocks. Um, and hopefully that was helpful to you. I do want to talk a little bit about the prep tray. We use a prep tray and a catheter over needle kit. Prep tray has everything in it that we need. It's got that 18 gauge needle for that initial poke. It's got all the draping that we need, the ultrasound probe cover, um, everything we need to clean this, the spot off. And then we've got the benzoin to tape at the uh, insertion point. Again, we use the catheter over needle for everything. Essentially, this is an angio cath. It's great, it's echogenic. We get right to the spot we wanna be and we thread that catheter off. There's no fooling around with the, the springiness of the, uh, the catheter through the needle. The other nice thing is that the, the catheter is larger than the needle, so that there is no real leaking from the insertion point. Dr. Smutzler, if we have yes. a question in the queue. Sure. How far do we thread the catheter in? 
So I tend to hub the catheter. To do that, you have to kind of predict how far away you are. So that's dependent on where you're starting, where in the spine you are, and then how big the patient is. I like to get it all the way to the hub. If I can't get it all the way to the hub, that's fine. But the more catheter that's under the skin, the less likely it is to move, um, and the more comfortable it tends to be for the patient. So uh, hopefully that answered the question. If not, um, ask, ask away, uh, you know, follow up, follow up questions if, uh, if you need to. This is the first open heart case that we did with erector spinae plane catheters. Uh, these are bilateral catheters. We started them about T7. These are the six inch catheters, they're pretty long. So we ended up between T3 and T4. Um, we do these pretty routinely for our open heart cases now. Patients do real well afterwards. We, uh, we actually used to put patients on PCAs in the ICU. Don't do that anymore. Um, if anything, they get one or two shots uh, of morphine uh, if they need it, which is pretty rare anymore. Uh, we also reduced our length of stay by about a day. So um, the, uh, the cardiac surgeon was quite happy with that. Um, and we do erector spinae plane catheters for essentially all our open heart now. This was a really interesting case at the surgery center. Um, this was a patient uh, who was on chronic opioids, came in with severe hydratinitis of both buttocks. Um, we were actually considering canceling him at the surgery center. Um, we, were, we were kind of afraid we weren't be, gonna be able to get him out. He was on quite a bit of, of chronic opioids. Um, we kind of batted around doing a saddle block and a few different things. And actually one of the CRNAs said, hey, you talk about these ESPs all the time, why don't we do ESPs? Um, I wasn't sure we'd be able to cover the majority of this, uh, this particular issue, uh, but we gave it a try anyway. We placed bilateral ESP catheters at L5. Uh, we had the tip just actually, just actually caudal to L5. Um, and uh, so we, we put in our normal dosing for that. We left those in, uh, this was a Friday. We left those in Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Um, I called the patient every day. Well, the patient woke up in PACU essentially pain-free. Um, got uh, 50 mics of fentanyl during the procedure and that was it. No other, no other opioids during the entire procedure or the, the PACU stay. A uh, patient went home over the weekend, called him every day. He was comfortable, didn't really have any pain at all, was taking only his, his uh, kind of home standard dose of his opioids, um, and then pulled him Monday, felt great, really never had any pain. And so I was, I was surprised that it worked for this, but again, it seems to be a ubiquitous block that works pretty well for a whole lot of things. So Dr. Schmutzler? Yes. With speaking with open heart patients and having longer procedures, how have you had any trouble seeing any skin breakdown with the patients lying on the catheter hubs for these for this longer period of time? We haven't, um, and I'll tell you what we do. Uh, so we do our standard placement, get everything set. We take four by fours and fold them over, and then do another tegaderm over those four by fours. Um, the the uh, piece that connects the hub to the skin actually has padding on the underside and then some gauze on the top side. So that helps as well. And then we place uh, the egg crate underneath the patient. So anything over about two hours, when I have the ESP catheters in, I'll place egg crate underneath them. We have not had breakdown of any kind. Uh, we extubate our patients for our open hearts at about four hours after surgery. So we keep the egg crate under there until they're awake and extubated. Once they're awake and extubated, they're moving and we're not really worried about it anymore. Um, so yeah, that was something that, that we thought about as well. Uh, the first couple cases we did, we didn't actually put the egg crate underneath uh, and the patients were fine, but out of an abundance of caution, we went ahead and did the egg crates. Uh, uh, but yeah, that, we haven't seen breakdown in any of, the, any of the patients we've done. All right. Again, if you, if you have any follow-ups to the questions that you ask, go ahead and, and pop those in and I'm happy to answer those as well. So I like to go through this, uh, this 2010 article from the Journal of Pain, kind of describing how how we were doing regional anesthesia for some procedures in 2010. Obviously, it's outdated, but um, so for thoracotomies, the recommendation of a paravertebral, open laparotomies, tap blocks, hip and knees, site-specific regional anesthesia techniques, spinal fusion, no regional anesthesia recommended, open heart, no anesthesia recommended, or regional anesthesia recommended then for C-sections, taps. In our practice, ESP catheters have now replaced essentially all of these. We now do ESP catheters after the patient's asleep, but before the procedure begins for our thoracotomies. Our open laparotomies, we kind of took a progression. We started with the tap blocks. Those work fine for the incision, but not great for the, uh, for the visceral pain. We went to quadratus lumborum blocks. 
those were inconsistent uh, and very difficult to do. And there were some logistical things where you had to kind of roll the patient up on their side. Patients didn't do well with these preoperatively. So there was a kind of a whole, whole process we went through. And then when we started doing ESP catheters, we found that those were very, very effective and the surgeons really liked those. Um, two areas where we weren't able to offer regional anesthesia previously, spinal fusions. Uh, and so essentially for all of our, um, all of our back cases, we're placing ESP catheters, even the, the laminectomies and the, uh, and the discectomies in the outpatient setting, we'll place a catheter, let the patient go home and they'll pull them out uh, at day three or four. And again, as I mentioned, the open heart uh, for, for our cabbages and our valves. What kind of concentration and rate are you, of infusion are you running on these patients post-op? Uh, so we are running 0.2% ropivacaine plain. Um, the rates are anywhere from seven to 12 milliliters per hour per side. Um, just depends on how painful we think the procedure is gonna be, uh, you know, what the, the patient's um, opioid use or naivete is, uh, and then, you know, whether we're, we're a unilateral or bilateral kind of affects that a little bit as well. But we just do the 0.2% plane. Um, if the patients are in the hospital, we'll go back uh, at about 24 hours ask them if they're having any pain. If they're having any pain at all, we'll re-bolus with essentially the initial dose we gave, 15 to 30 mLs of half percent ropivacaine. If they're at home, and this rarely happens, I'd say of the, geez, probably 500 or 600 that we've sent home with these, I think three have come back and wanted a, a top-up bolus. And so we'll bring them back to the surgery center or the hospital and again, give them a, give them a bolus the day after. But we give a, a fairly high amount initially, and then we're running those catheters at 7, 10, or 12 mLs per hour per side, and the patients really don't ever get a pain level much above three for the most part. Uh, our cesarean sections, we went from doing transverse abdominal plane catheters to ESP catheters. Uh, we do these after the, after the baby's out, after the, the mom's sewn up. We'll give the baby to dad, which gives them a little time together, roll the patient up on, their, on her side, and place bilateral ESP catheters at about L1, L2, give or take. Uh, we'll run those while the patient's in the hospital and then pull them out as soon as the patient leaves. And we've essentially gone away from having to use any opioids. We give a little bit of Toradol because that helps with the crampy pain from the, uh, from the uterus, but essentially the patients do well without any opioids uh, and, and just use the ESP catheter. We, uh, we're starting to use ESP catheters for our anterior total hip replacements. We still do FI catheters uh, for our uh, standard posterior hips, but the ESP catheters gave us a, a little bit of a benefit in the fact that we were able to place them preoperatively for the anterior hip replacements. Patients do quite well. The pain relief is equivalent, maybe even better than the FI catheters. Uh, and again, the patients, we do a lot of these outpatients. The patient will go home with the ESP catheter, pull it out at home, uh, and they do do quite well with these. And the surgeons have been happy with these as well. Uh, we don't do ESP catheters for total knee replacements, but now there's some evidence in the literature that it may be helpful. Uh, we do ad adductor canal catheters and single shot eye packs. Um, again, we do a lot of these outpatient, so we send the patients home same day. Um, but there are some people out there doing ESP catheters for the total knee replacements. Uh, I'll just walk you slowly or uh, quickly through um, our kind of progression of how we, we brought these into our practice. We started with breast surgery. Uh, we were doing paravertebral catheters for our breast surgeons anyway, um, but they're pretty time consuming. They're pretty uncomfortable for the patients, uh, and they're, they're kind of uncomfortable for, for anesthesia staff as well. Um, you're close to the lung. You can't, don't always get a great view. Sometimes it's hard to thread the catheter. So we just switched to, to ESP catheters uh, on all our breast procedures. So mastectomies, recons, lymph node dissections, elective breast surgeries like implants and reductions and breast scar revisions. The added benefit that we found from the ESP, which we didn't necessarily expect, was that we also captured the axilla for when the surgeons were doing um, axillary lymph node dissections and sentinel lymph node biopsies in addition to the, the breast procedure. Um, we missed that with the, uh, the paravertebral blocks, but we don't miss that with, uh, with the ESP blocks. So we're quite well with the breast surgeons. We then moved on to the abdominal procedures. As I mentioned, we went kind of through that progression of TAPS, quadratus lumborum, and then to the ESPs. We use these for essentially all of our abdominal procedures, even occasionally the laparoscopic gyne procedures and some, uh, some laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomies in patients who have some, some chronic pain issues. 
So again, colectomies, colostomies, guide procedures, C-sections, as I mentioned, big laparotomies, whipples, splenectomies, colostomies. We've gone away completely from, from epidurals, really. Esophagectomies are nice because you can catch both the abdominal and the thoracic region. Nephrectomies, these have been great. We were doing the QLs, but they get in the way. We'd have to wait till post-op. So now we do the, uh, the ESP catheters preoperatively. The patients do real, real well. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the cholecystectomies. I think it makes sense that we use these for thoracoscopies, thoracoscopies, thoracotomies, and sternal procedures. Again, we just went from using paravertebral blocks to, to, the, um, to the ESP catheters. Um, the, the other nice benefit of the ESP catheters, and I'll talk about this later, is we don't worry about anticoagulation with ESP. Um, you're far enough away from the spine, you're not likely to hit anything where there would be an issue. Uh, and there was plenty of evidence early on of people using ESP catheters in fully anticoagulated rib fracture patients and, and open heart patients. So we don't worry about anticoagulation. Again, we use these for our VATs, our robotic VATs, our thoracotomies, and our mediastinoscopies and stenotomies. Rib fractures, as I mentioned, these are a huge, huge help in rib fractures. We were initially, back when I was in residency, uh, doing uh, epidurals for our rib fractures. Um, obviously, there's a lot of issue that comes with that, particularly with with anticoagulation. We moved to the paravertebral blocks. Again, more difficult to do, more time consuming, more painful. Um, and again, I think you run into the anticoagulation issue with paravertebrals as well. But then we converted about a year and a half ago to doing ESP catheters for all of our rib fractures. So we do them for acute rib fractures in the ED, in the ICU, or in the operating room. There are some chronic pain doctors. I don't do any chronic pain anymore, but there are some chronic pain doctors doing, uh, doing these for uh, chronic post root fracture pain and chronic post thoracotomy pain. We already talked ad nauseum about the open heart procedure. So all of our sternal procedures, valve replacements and open heart cabbages, uh, we, we place these catheters preoperatively. We don't do these for our emergency hearts, obviously, but um, for our, our elective kind of run of the mill uh, open heart procedures, we're using ESP catheters for essentially all of those. Uh, thoracic and lumbar spine procedures, I think we've made a huge, huge impact here. Um, you know, the spine surgeons, they have the patients who are most often the ones who are on chronic opioids, very hard to treat, um, and very painful procedures. And so we started doing these initially just on our kind of one and two level uh, fusions, posterior and anterior fusions, and the patients did really, really well. Essentially 100% pain relief for these patients. We started then expanding to, to longer and longer, bigger and bigger procedures, three, four, five, six level fusions. We found that when you get above about three levels, you get about 50 to 60% pain relief. Um, so we were, we were hoping it'd be 100%, but it wasn't, but it was still very, very helpful and really cut down the amount of uh, opioids used by these patients postoperatively. And actually, sorry. yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, that's all right. We had a question uh, regarding back to your spine, que spine questions. Yeah. Huh? Um, how do you place the catheters for spinal fusion without getting in them into the surgeon's surgical field? Sure. So um, for our one and two level fusions, the, the surgeon, the one that we do this the most with, um, he's very good about telling us, you know, how big his decision is going to be and where he's going to be. So we'll place them a level or two above or a level or two below or both if we're at a large fusion on both sides. Um, and what that does, so the, the ESP uh, the local anesthetic, um, at least in the cadaveric studies, seems to go five levels each direction. Um, so that gives you a huge, uh, huge area that you can cover. Now, it probably doesn't give you five levels of clinical effect. In our hands, it's about three levels each direction. So you get six levels of clinical effect. So one or two level fusions, we can easily go a level or two above or a level or two below. For the bigger fusions, three, four, five, six level fusions, we wait till the end of the procedure and we'll place the catheters again kind of a level below and a level above on each side. And we'll run actually four catheters for that. Um, and, and that's how, kind of how we do things for the bigger fusions. With this placement, do, do you still repeat the, uh, do you still use the uh, repivacaine? Yes. Yep. Okay. Same. Same. So, so your initial dosing would remain the same? Correct. Could you repeat what your initial dosing was, please? Yep. So our initial dosing, depending on the weight of the patient and the procedure, is 15 to 30 milliliters of half percent ropivacaine per side. Added to that, we put 10 milligrams of preservative-free dec decadron across the whole block and 50 to 75 micrograms of Presidex, dexmedetomidine, across the whole block. 
And then we run the catheters with 0.2% ropivacaine plain at seven to 12 milliliters per hour per side. Good? Great, thank you. Okay. All right, so we do these for our discectomies, both open and robotic, our fusions open and robotic, minimally invasive surgeries, and our anterior and lateral approaches to, uh, to spinal fusions as well, and our 360s. Um, we, we used to do tap catheters for our anterior and lateral approaches, uh, and we, we found that we got pretty good incisional pain, but we really didn't get any, uh, any coverage of the pain from the bone or the disc. And we found when we switched to the ESP, because we get both the dorsal and the ventral portions, of the spinal nerves, as well as probably some sympathetic and some BRG, we really covered all of the pain a whole lot better. I did mention uh, anticoagulation. We don't worry at all about anticoagulation on patients when we're placing ESP catheters. So ASRA currently has no recommendation. Um, they don't say one way or the other what you should do for an ESP block. Typically, ASRA based the recommendations upon the likelihood of vascular violation. So in this particular instance, the only vasculature near the erector spinae plane is a periosteum. So there's some vessels in that periosteum. The only time you're gonna hit that is when you first go in and when you hit the bone. And those tend to bleed quickly and then go away very quickly. And there's really not a whole lot of blood there. So your likelihood of vascular violation of any consequence is minimal. The compressibility of the space. So in the, in the ESP, essentially the space is between a bone and a very strong muscle. So you're likely to have a lot of compressibility there and to tamponade that spot off if you were to have any bleeding. And then the consequences of the hematoma. So what's the consequence of a hematoma in the ESP in the rectus spinae plane? Really nothing. Um, if, that, if that hematoma would track into the epidural space, potentially you'd have some issue, but I think it would be very difficult for any decent amount of blood to coagulate and to travel into that epi epidural space in any relevant amount. There's been multiple e uh, reports of ESPs, uh, both single shots and catheters done on fully anticoagulated patients, open heart patients on heparin, uh, rib fracture patients on Plavix, Eliquis, and many other procedures with patients on the whole gamut of, of uh, anticoagulants. And I think probably most profoundly in the literature, and I, I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't looked in a couple of weeks, but in the literature, I found no reported epidural hematomas from ESP catheters. So I think that makes us feel pretty comfortable that, uh, that we're not going to have an issue on anticoagulated patients. Talk a little bit about the benefit of continuous nerve blocks in the on cue pain system. Um, again, we do this as a continual nerve block because Essentially, you get rebound pain if you do a single shot block. So even if we get 18 hours, which is the max that I've seen any, uh, really any data saying the single shot block will get you. After 18 hours, that patient's going to go from 0 to 10 to 9 or 10 out of 10 if, you're, if you don't place a catheter and have a continuous, uh, continuous infusion. So the on -cue system reduces opioid use, provides pain relief, not just for hours, but for days. We leave them in, like I said, three to seven days typically. Uh, depending on the procedure and, and the, uh, the pain that the patient's having, if they're having any, um, and then what the patient wants. Um, I'll often even change the, the on-cue balls over, leave those catheters in, switch the on-cue ball to another set to give them another couple of days. Reducing complications due to opioid use, respiratory depression, addiction, urinary retention, as we all know. Uh, what's really nice about on-cue is that they offer customizability. So the, I give the patient the ability to turn the pump on, off, up, down, as much as they want. I think that leads to satisfaction, not only because their pain is better, but also because they have control over how much pain relief they get and how, and how they're distributing the local anesthetic. And then you improve cost effectiveness because essentially you decrease complications and you decrease the length of stay. We've shown in the majority of procedures we've gone, uh, we've reduced the length of stay at least a day, and we've been able to take a whole bunch of our procedures now to the surgery center and get these patients out day of surgery. So the ESPs have been a really profound and very, very powerful to us uh, in our clinical setting. OnQ also supports your practice's success. So they help you with implementation of ERAS, of uh, block programs, of acute pain service. They give ongoing training like this uh, to uh, anesthesiologists, staff, and surgeons. Uh, they have a 24-hour hotline staffed by clinicians that 
the majority of calls can go to and not have to go to a doc who's placed it. And then they give you local support with great reps in your area. Um, I do uh, often get the question, what about XPRO? I'll tell you a, a few pearls that I've found in the uh, probably year and a half now that I've been talking about ESP catheters. XPRO is not indicated um, according to the IFU. Uh, this is a deep block. This is not just a plain block. This is a deep block. So placing XPRO is not on label. It's off label use. Uh, so far, there's only been one published study. It was a very interesting study on one patient. Um, and basically, the patient got an 18 hour block, which is what I get anyway with my additives. Uh, it was later redacted because the authors did not disclose their, uh, their financial relationship with Basira. Um, when, in traveling the country, talking about ESP, teaching ESP, doing uh, cadaver labs, I've had three reports to me told personally of poor outcomes of, of uh, providers who used XPRL in the ESP blocks. All three of them ended up in the ICU. One was intubated for 24 hours. One was in the ICU with not only respiratory issues, but blood pressure issues. And one ended up in the ICU for 48 hours because they had such profound uh, sympathectomy and decreased blood pressure after the block that they were monitored for the 48 hours uh, because of the XPRL likely tracking into the epidural space. Uh, the other thing, just practically, when you place XPRL, even if you expand it with saline or some non-active fluid, you just don't have enough volume. This block is a volume block. And it's not just a volume block when you first do it, it's a volume block over time. So you really need volume in that space, keep it open, keep those nerves bathed. And that just doesn't happen with, with the XPRO. I do often get questions again about reimbursement. Uh, so I will tell you there's currently not an ESP code. Um, uh, I've been told by several people that the AMA and the CPT system are working on it. This seems to be a similar process as to what happened with the paravertebral blocks. And so what I'll tell you, what we use, we use the paravertebral code for this, the 64463. Six, That's the uh, paravertebral catheter code. And when we code it, we send it to the, to the uh, insurance companies with uh, the, the term paravertebral block done via the erector spinae plane approach. So we write that every time we submit this block and we very, very rarely get any pushback from the insurance companies. This is a high level block and you, you end up with high level reimbursement. Uh, and so as, as anybody who does paravertebrals knows, um, the paravertebrals tend to reimburse quite well. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Fantastic. So uh, are your backs being done mostly in the ASC or in the hospital systems? Uh, so we typically will do one and two level backs uh, in the ASC, uh, definitely the discs and the, and the small lammies. Uh, but the one and two level fusions are getting moved more and more into the ASC. Okay. So with these blocks, the patients, uh, they've, someone said they've heard that they will hit four to five levels. They've also heard that they'll hit one level. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so that's highly, highly volume dependent and whether or not you use a catheter dependent. So I'll tell you what happens. If you, if you skimp on the volume, if you put 10 or 15 milliliters in on a big patient, you're gonna get a level or two and it's not gonna be as helpful. When we, when we up dose or give a fair volume, we get three levels each direction. So we, we get five or six levels of coverage the majority of the time. What happens is as the local anesthetic from that bolus fades, you lose a level. You tend to lose a level about every six to eight hours. So that's again why we do the catheters. We have continual local anesthetic in there, keeps those levels uh, you know, expanded, keeps that space expanded, keeps the patient comfortable. So I would say that you're, the reason you're getting a single level or why you hear about reports of single level is they're not using high enough dosage or they're not using high enough concentration, or a high enough volume or concentration. The block is all dose dependent, so concentration and volume. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a trip back to C-sections. Okay. Why would you place a catheter pre-op? Why would you not place the catheter preoperatively for a C-section like you do for a, do a spinal? Yeah. So the spinal is essentially the anesthetic for the procedure. So 
we just found that moms don't like getting poked with the spinal and then they're they're sitting there and now we got to place the catheters roll them on their side they want the baby out right so the, the spinal is still in effect when the C-section is over, so they're still numb. They're not feeling us place the catheters, but we don't really need them for intra-op management. The, the spinal's already in there, and that, that's good, in our opinion, that's good enough for intra-op management. We don't do any uh, more uh, duramorph at all. We do a very small amount of fentanyl, about 15 mics of fentanyl, just for the synergistic effect. Um, but then we find that placing the catheters afterwards, again, gives dad a little bit of time with the baby, and then, you know, mom's ready to have that baby out when they come to the operating room. They don't want to sit there for an additional 10, 15 minutes while we're placing catheters, but they don't mind so much afterwards. All the adrenaline's kind of coming down. They're happy to just relax and dad's happy to have time with the baby. So that's why we do it. I don't see any reason why you couldn't. You certainly could do the spinal and then place the catheters. That just hasn't been kind of what we decided to do. So with your single shot and uh, catheter regimens, have you noticed any hemodynamic issues with your patients? Very, very little. Uh, the only hemodynamic issue we find, well, I'll give you, there's two things. Um, one, uh, we get a very, very minor uh, sympathectomy when we actually place the block. Uh, with our paravertebrals, we were getting 10, 20% drop in blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, so we had to be real careful with those. With the ESPs, we get now oh, maybe 5% at the most. So patients don't notice that really. And, and you know, you're, you're talking about dropping blood pressure from 120 to 110. You know, it's, it's really not a huge issue. Um, the Presidex does make the patients a little bit bradycardic and that lasts. So, you know, if the patient is, has a heart rate of 75, that, that patient ends up with a heart rate, well, probably 65 to 70. Uh, and it also gives them a little additional sedation, which actually we like. So they're sedated preoperatively uh, for a little while. They're sedated in the operating room. And then about the time they're coming out of the operating room, uh, the sedation is pretty much worn off from the Presidex. So I would say those are the two kind of hemodynamic issues that we have, but they are much, much less than we ever had with paravertebral blocks and certainly much less than with, a, with an epidural. Thank you very much. Our queue is empty. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I, I tend to sit around uh, for a little while uh, while you guys kind of talk amongst yourselves and come up with questions. Sometimes things kind of pop up as you're, as you're thinking through the presentation. So um, I'll, I'll hang out here for a, a little while and uh, let you guys kind of get some questions in if you'd like. And I'll, I'll put myself on mute. If you happen to get another question, just pop it my way, but otherwise I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be on mute here. I suppose I'll ask the question and maybe somebody, somebody out there can kind of chime in. Um, what kind of results are you guys seeing kind of out in the field uh, with the ESP blocks and catheters? Um, if anybody has any insight on that, feel free to, to kind of give us that, that insight as well. Okay, we do have a couple of questions. Okay, do you, do you know if ASRA plans to update the anticoagulant RECs for the ESP? Uh, so I, I don't have a, I don't have great insight into what ASRA does and doesn't do. Um, they still haven't completely updated the paravertebrals. Um, you know, they, they, the last uh, iteration, which I think was probably about a year ago, um, they sort of started steering people away from doing paravertebrals on anticoagulation. Um, I think the ESP is new enough. You know, it's only been around since the end of 2016. Um, and I'm not sure when the next time they're going to update things is. They tend to do it every couple of years. So if I had to guess, I would say probably 2021, we'll hear something about it. Um, but I, I think there's just mounting evidence. There's lots and lots and lots of people doing ESPs on patients who are fully anticoagulated. And nobody's really, at least they're not publishing or talking about any issues that they're having. Um, and we've done, you know, several hundred on patients who, who are anti, fully anticoagulated. We just don't see much of an issue. Um, the only time we ever get really a hematoma um, is if you go down sort of low, mid to low thoracic spine, there seems to be some sort of vessel that kind of travels through one of the muscular layers. Um, and we tend, to, we tend to hit it as we do our, uh, our injection of our um, lidocaine local for the skin and the, and the wheel kind of underneath the skin and into the muscle. Um, we put a little pressure on it and it goes away. So that, that is the only hematoma-like activity we've ever seen. Uh, my guess would be to uh, another, you know, probably 
12 to 18 months before they make a recommendation. But I don't have any independent knowledge of that. Thanks. So when you're doing your C-section patients, obviously they've just had a baby. If you're putting your, your block in, post your, your catheters in post-operatively, Correct. are you putting these patients prone or are you doing them laterally? Yeah, we do those laterally. So that's one of the two instances that we do laterally. Uh, well, three, depending on where the rib fractures are. But uh, yeah, we roll them up on their side and just place them both uh, in the lateral position. Um, the nurses in the room and the techs in the room kind of help hold the, the patient up. It's kind of a sloppy lateral. We lay that, that top leg kind of over the top of the bottom leg. Um, and so a little sloppy lateral position, but it opens up that back. Yeah, we're, we're not putting them on their bellies. Um, the, okay. other thing, the other things we do on, uh, in a lateral position, the thoracotomies, because they're already in that position. Um, you know, we, we place the tube lines, roll them up on their side, and then place the block while the, they're getting ready to uh, clean and do all the, the other stuff pre-procedure. Uh, and then rib fractures. If they have anterior rib fractures, we won't place them on their belly because that hurts them quite a bit. If patients have posterior rib fractures, like, actually a lot of them prefer to be on their stomach um, if they have that posterior rib fracture. So for those, we'll go prone. But if they're having any discomfort, prone, we'll do those lateral as well. Great. Back to your question to the audience. Um, some of the responses are we're seeing single shots, but not a co commitment to catheters. Okay. Um, they are see generally seeing exceptional results. Good. They question is, um, have you seen any patients have difficulty with muscle weakness after this block? Uh, we haven't. Um, so I wouldn't expect it in the uh, in the high thoracic for the breast cases. Uh, and in fact, I'd expect less than the paravertebral blocks. I've actually talked to, to several people who have had kind of both the paravertebrals and the ESPs. And the patients who have the ESPs tend to have less of that heavy chest feeling. Um, so I, I don't think you really get motor block um, definitely in the thoracic region. We were a little concerned in the lumbar region for both spine and for our total anterior total hips. Uh, we we ha just haven't seen it. Um, you know, in fact, we see less motor weakness with the ESPs than we do with the FIs. Um, and so it's interesting. I don't have a great explanation, except that maybe they're so, uh, the, the local anesthetic is kind of tracking in so slowly that it's really not getting to a high enough concentration to get motor. So, you know, sensory goes before motor, obviously. So if you're, if you're getting sensory and not motor, uh, maybe it's, it's concentration related or kind of diffusion related, but I, I, don't, I don't know that that's been studied and I don't have a great explanation, but I'd say of the, gosh, I don't know how many we've done now, 800, 900, something like that, of these blocks, we have not seen any motor block whatsoever. All right, what kind of probe do you use for your ESP box for what lumbar? Kind of, what kind of probe? Yeah, yes. so uh, we have a, a mini curvilinear. Um, I have had to go to the curvilinear once or twice, but I tend to use the mini curvilinear. Uh, and you almost always have to do that in the lumbar spine because of the lordosis uh, and because those muscles get so much thicker in the lumbar spine, we almost always change over to either a mini or a large curvilinear. I prefer the mini curvilinear because you know, that large curvilinear goes from uh, often, I think it's like eight to like 25. I, I don't need 25, but the mini curvilinear tends to go in that kind of five or six to 12 range. And if we're over 12, I can't get down there with the needle anyway. So um, uh, for the most part, I tend to use that mini curvilinear. Gives you a very nice view. Uh, and the other nice thing is that you're just aiming for bone. So all you have to see is that reflection, that kind of bright white reflection off that transverse process. Your bone is there uh, and you'll be able to see it nicely. One last question for you. What are, what are some potential complications that um, you would discuss with this patient kind of before you start scanning them or putting the catheter in? So really the only complications that we really find with these are the complications of any regional anesthetic, right? Mm -hmm. So you can get infection at the skin, you get a little bit of pain with placement. Um, and, you know, you could always have the, the risk of local anesthetic toxicity, although I think it's very, very low for this particular block. We really don't find any complications with these at all. Um, like I said, the, the only thing we find is because we put the, a decent amount of Presidex in, the patients are very, very sleepy. Um, and then the little bit of bradycardia. Honestly, we really have not seen any complications with these. Um, you know, I guess one, we had one patient who... Uh, <laughs> who tried to mess with the catheter a little bit and kinked it. So I suppose that was one sort of 
bad outcome we had, but a king catheter just means we had to pull it out. Uh, but when I talked to the patients, I essentially just talked to them about standard risk for any local anesthetic uh, procedure. Great, thank you very much. I'll hang on for another five minutes or so uh, if anybody else has any more questions. And I always like to say at the end of these talks, if anybody wants to contact me directly, just go ahead and ask your rep. Um, I think the majority of the reps have my, my contact information. If they don't have it, they can easily get it. So uh, they can easily reach out to me anytime and I can, uh, I can interact with you via either email or text or phone or uh, whatever, whatever's easiest for you guys. I'm always happy to help. So. Um, Pretty, pretty accessible if, uh, if you need me. All right, one last question when we'll call sure. it a night. Mm -hmm. uh, what level do you place the ESP catheter for total hips? Yeah, total hips, we try to get it about L1. Uh, that tends to be the area we get the, the most relief at. If we're one level above or one level below because we get so much spread, it still works pretty well. But we aim for L1. And we tend to do it cranial to caudal because I would rather the local anesthetic travel down than up. I don't really care about the T12 or T11 or T10 region, um, but it works, works pretty well for those if you get it about L1. Jacob, thank you. We, we can probably sign off. All right. Thank you. And with that, on behalf of Avanos, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. This concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day.